Hello class, I hope you're keeping safe. We are back to our class on international environmental law and policy. My name is Shiro Mogeni, I'm your lecturer and then the unit code is 40, uh, 4206. We've been able to cover a number of, um, of modules within our class and one of the things that is remaining is international regulation of uh, hazardous and toxic substances, which we'll be covering, which, will be, which we are covering for today's class. So just a recap of what we've been, we've been able to cover. We did historical development of environmental law. We introduced principles of international environmental law. We discussed management of biodiversity, sustainable management of transboundary water resources, and um, who are the global actors in environmental, international environmental law. So the next topic which we're covering today is uh, management of azaleas and toxic substances. And uh, just a highlight on the legality on use and threat of use of nuclear energy at the global level. So a synopsis of the presentation will commence with the terminologies just to understand what is hazardous substances, what is toxic substances, and why we need to manage these substances. Then also look at the prior informed consent procedures because remember, at the global level, we've been... Up, um, We've been, uh, there is approval generally for countries to trade on hazardous and toxic substances. But there's a concept, a principle on uh, prior informed concept, prior informed concept that must be adhered to when you're doing trade in international in hazardous and sub toxic substances. We're also looking, looking at the transboundary movement. Now that the law permits trade in hazardous and toxic substances, what is the criteria for these substances to move from one country to another? For example, if Uganda wants to transit hazardous toxic substances to Kenya, and we know there's a country perhaps in between, so we must get prior consent from Uganda, any country that the goods, that the goods will be passing through, and Kenya also as a recipient country. We look at a few case laws, basically, looking at the emergence of the need to come up with a law, regulatory framework on hazardous and toxic substances, Basically laws, the case, the incidences that happened before some of these laws that we'll be discussing were developed. Then we finalize our discussion with the Kenyan context. What does the law say in Kenya? What provisions do we have? Institutional framework do we have in terms of management of waste products in our country? One of the reference key material that we've been discussing in all previous classes is the book by Bunny and Patricia, which is basically International Law and Environment in, for 1994. Um, so kindly remember as we normally refer to that textbook, that is our lead textbook, which has been available in the library, but you can also get a version of it online when you utilize the different platforms that you have at the university. So I will commence by discussing what is hazardous waste products. Basically, these are residues or combination of residues from chemical products. These are waste products. They might be organic or inorganic, but basically are products that if they are not basic managed properly, they are harmful to the environment and they are harmful for human beings. It might be corrosive. For example, you can find an acid, an acid waste product that when it touches your skin, it corrodes with your skin. Or when it is inhaled, for example, when you're spraying doom in your rooms and you inhale that doom to a level to a higher concentration, or you emit it to a level that is not it will not it is harmful to your health, it will lead to inhalation of toxic substances which will de deteriorate your health pro your health generally. There are other hazardous waste products that are explosive. When we dispose of and discard our waste products in the house, it's normally recommended, and it happens more in developed countries, that the waste product that is organic is, is managed separately from inorganic product. For example, you can't dispose of a doom, a container which had doom or pesticide, with cabbages and potatoes that have been used as a byproduct. Because that mixture also brings another level of toxics and hazardous substances. That might be harmful to the environment outside there, but it also be harmful in your internal environment in the house. So that we're looking at how do we manage these substances to, for our own protection in our household level, but the protection of the global environment. Because we are the users, we are the ones who mix these chemicals to be able to produce a material that we need. In some instances, we mix them that it to a level that it comes to the radioactive material, which has nucleolites. We've been discussing this in, the, in previous classes. So why it is important for us to manage 
this product is because we don't have a clear infrastructure at the global level on management of hazardous and waste product. Then we also lack sufficient regulatory and institutional frameworks at country level to manage waste management products. Thank God to Kenya we have NEMA, the National Environmental Management Authority, but in other countries this is a discussion that they have to put it in their top agenda. Toxic substances are a component of hazardous substances. They are toxic because these are chemicals. They are chemicals which come from reactive products. We take carbon dioxide, mix it with sulfur dioxide. What will give us as a byproduct is basically a toxic substance. That if it's not well managed, it will be hazardous to the environment and for human beings, for the survival of human beings. We can make reference even to the current situation that you have of coronavirus, COVID-19. We are not so sure of the substances that were mixed for us to be able to now experience environmental damage. Human beings are, are fighting for survival because of a chemical reaction that was mixed up that is now a byproduct of a process that is harmful to the environment. These are the current discussions that we are looking at and these are the issues that inform why we need to look carefully on the trade in hazardous and toxic substances at the global level and at the international, and at the national level. So management, why we need to manage them, one, is because we want to see what is the impact, the risk assessment of us having a nuclear plant in Kenya. What happens when there's an incident or leakage of radioactive materials from these nuclear plants? This is why we need management at the global level. We need to adhere to guidelines at the global level and at the national level. How do we treat and store these waste products? If we permit a country to uh, 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 an industry to develop uh, to to, uh, to install a nuclear plant for us to be able even to have lights for us to be able to have uh, batteries to charge our our phones batteries to charge our radios and torch we must look at what is the storage mechanism for this product when you have a pro you want to, at the end of the day to produce a battery. How do you manage the waste products that come from that production of the battery? That is the problem that we want to address in our today's class. The disposal mechanism. What are the disposal mechanism within your country or context that are favorable enough to ensure that there is no leakage, there is no exposure to the environment of these toxins and hazardous substances? There are countries who come up with a sink. They basically dig a big hole. They construct a sink made of metal to be able to dump and store all those waste products so that they are not exposed to the environment. But remember in our previous class we also discussed how you can construct a sink. You need approval from the conference of parties. When you're opening your sink, you also need approval from the conference of parties. But basically that is what one of the mechanisms you're using in waste management. The other aspect of it is waste minimization. Because remember, we produce a product, but how we modify them? Look at our Dandora dumping site. Dandora dumping site is a dumping site, yes, um, that is uh, designed by the government for us to be able to dump our waste products. But how we dump them, we have modified the byproduct cabbages mixed together with doom, mixed together with all other used products within our household that brings out a certain level of toxi intoxication to the environment to the, and to the community. These are instances where we'll have increase in the number of cancer cases in our country because of our poor management of waste products. The concentration level is also one of the key components that is important in terms of management of these products because the level of emission of these gases, some of them are gases, some of them are liquid, some of them are in solid form. The level and capacity of emission of these gases is important and critical to the global level. Because remember, these gases emit from the ground when we use them or a fertilization or even maybe the organic product that we're getting from the byproducts from animals. They come up, they mix with other gases into the air, they go to the ozone layer, mix with the ozone gas, and of course, case, they cause depletion of the ozone layer. This is one of the things that we need to protect at the global level is how this waste product contributes to the depletion of the ozone layer. We look at also another issue of management and cost. Why we need this regulation of azadia substances at the international level is for us to see how countries can be able to cost share 
the management of this product so that if your capacity level in terms of finances are a bit low and we know that if you're having an industry that produces waste products that are dangerous to the environment at the end of the day we need to consolidate all our funds to be able to address issues of protection of the ozone layer that is where management and cost effectiveness must be done at the global level and see how we can support countries like haiti haiti has been a victim of dumping of waste hazardous waste products but Haiti does not have the financial capacity to dispose them so we are coming up with a consolidated fund the green fund to be able to assist countries that do not have resources for that so in that context at the international level we came up with a Rotterdam convention on the prior informed consent procedure for certain hazardous chemicals and pesticides in international trade basically this is referred to us as the Rotterdam convention it's a convention that emerged after the Rio conference. Remember, in other of the first class, we discussed about the Rio conference. It gave us the Rio declaration. And one of the things that it gave us, it gave us also is the Agenda 21. So Article 19 of the Agenda 21 talks about the need for countries to manage waste products that are dangerous to the environment and human health. This is why the case of the Rotterdam Convention was enacted, for it to be a global a regulatory instrument for countries to be able to be bound with the procedures of regulating hazardous and toxic substances but specifically also this convention recognizes that we have the authority to do trade but how do we do trade that to ensure that we cover the countries that are not interest, interested in trade in hazardous and toxic substances so one of the key responsibilities of this convention basically there are two one is the introduction of the principle of prior informed consent. The other one is the principle of information sharing. Because why it is important is we had a case, which is called the Kian case, K-H-I-A-N case, which is a case of a company called Kian, which was established in Liberia. Basically what they did, they, they, they attempted to dump waste product in a form of ashes, in New Jersey, they attempted to dump it in Bahamas, they attempted to dump it in Panama, but those countries refused. But at the end of the day, those ashes were dumped in Haiti, which basically without approval of Haiti as a country. And once those products were dumped, it took Haiti, the products were dumped in 1988, but up to to date, as recent as 2000, Haiti was still working on disposal of those management of, of those waste products that were dumped from uh, from that company they claimed they were dumping fertilizers topsoil fertilizers so haiti well, the farmers in haiti agreed to the dumping because they thought this is the topsoil fertilizer that is going to help the country in terms of their production crop production basically it turned out to be a hazardous and toxic substances in form of ash of course the case was prosecuted and the country was held liable so these are the two principles that the convention is coming on board. Promotion of shared and cooperative responsibilities between countries. The other one is information sharing so that countries are aware of who is doing trade. If Kenya and Rwanda, for example, come up with an agreement to transfer to, to trade in hazardous toxic substance or radioactive materials. So we know Uganda is in the middle of Kenya and, and uh, Rwanda. So the informed consent as a principle in this convention talks about you got Rwanda sharing information with us, Kenya accepting that the goods, that the hazardous substance is going to be disposed of in our country. But because the, the product will be transiting and moving through Rwanda, Rwanda also must get consent, must consent that I as a country, as the president Paul Kigame, I agree that the product which is leaving my country is going to pass through Uganda. And Uganda, as the president, His Excellency Seven, agrees that if Uganda is going to be a transit zone, and Kenya agrees that the waste product will be dumped in Kenya. So the consent level is threefold. The exporter must consent and give prior proper information on what is transporting, giving details, giving the on the chemical that's transporting the capacity, the concentration level, and in the event of a leakage, what measures does Uganda as a transit country is able to take in terms of management of these hazardous substances? So one of the things that, in, just to go detail in terms of the Rotterdam Convention is, it talks about the import decisions as circulated. 
remember if there are three countries Uganda Kenya and Tanzania Uganda no Uganda Rwanda and Kenya the business is between Rwanda and Kenya but the decision must be circulated in East Africa generally that let Tanzania let Somali let Burundi know there's a transaction of international movement of azadia substances between Rwanda and Kenya so that in the event of exposure, all the countries in East Africa must be aware of it. Remember, again, this is a discussion that must be done at the global level through the Conference of Parties. We've been discussing about the Conference of Parties as a decision-making body at the global level. So the decision, again, must be communicated to the Conference of Parties. So the Convention, Rotterdam Convention, insists on informed consent that is circulated and disseminated within all the concerned parties and at the global level. The other thing he's emphasizing on is exporting countries are obliged to take appropriate measures. This takes us back to the other class on principles of environmental, international environmental law. Precautionary principle, preventative principle, principle. Polluter pays also comes into play. Compensation also is one of the principles that if at all there's a leakage because of improper packaging of these hazardous substances, the exporter country is liable in terms of the management of that product. So the owner will be in Rwanda. The owners for taking care of precautionary principle, preventative principle before the goods is released is basically in Rwanda before the goods transit through Uganda and comes to Kenya. The Rotterdam Convention also talks about an excess of list of pesticides and chemical substances that are extremely dangerous. So that if a country decides to trade in these chemicals which are listed in an extra three, which are severely hazardous uh, pesticides, they have to again consent. That I have not only consented to the trade of hazardous substances, but also in addition I have consented in the trade of severely hazardous pesticides that are listed under an extra three of the Rotterdam Convention. So it goes deeper, there's a deeper conversation on the prior informed consent, which is basically the PIC procedure, which is the main fundamental principle that is introduced in the Rotterdam Convention. Then the convention also introduces a committee. It's called the Chemical Review Committee. This committee is basically the one that helps us to review an extra three, that which chemicals have now been clustered in 2020 as most severely hazardous substances. So it keeps on reviewing the annexures to be able for countries to be informed on what are the new measures that they should be taking. We have also one of the procedures called the decision guide document, which is prepared and sent to all parties, basically listing all the other annexures, the, the chemical documents, the chemicals that are listed under Annex 3. So once it is updated, it is shared via the decision guide document. Then all parties must take a decision as to whether they will allow future import of each of the chemicals listed in Annex 3. So that we can decide to trade with Rwanda on one of the chemicals listed in uh, and an extra three, but we say after our trade in 2020, moving forward in 2021, we will not be able to trade in any chemical that is listed in an extra three, so that the global environment is aware of your decision. Another aspect is all exporting parties are required to ensure that exports of chemical subject to their prior informed procedures do not occur contrary to the decision of importing parties. That if you want to trade in these substances, and Kenya as a country has already made a decision, we will not trade in those substances. So we, we, the, the exporting country must adhere to our consent, must adhere to our regulation, so that we don't have illegal dumping of, of waste products as it happens in uh, Haiti, it happened one time in Nigeria and many other developing countries. So basically, uh, you need to notify the Secretariat. Secretariat is basically the UN environment on the domestic regulatory actions that a country has taken, whether you've banned the transportation or whether you intend to do trade with a country on transport transportation of those hazardous pro uh, substances. Then you're also supposed to share your experience. After we've done trade with Uganda, with Rwanda, and we experience challenges in terms of management of these products. They are, yes, dumped in our country, but our management infrastructure, resources, human resource was not sufficient enough for us to be able to manage these uh, products. We must be able to communicate back to the exporting country, we must be able to communicate back to the UN environment and the Secretariat, basically, on what are the challenges that we experience and what measures can the global environment develop in dealing with that. 
It also introduces safety data sheet to be sent to importers to be ensured that you understand the risk involved in importation and trade in those substances. So that in future you don't say, we did not understand the risk. It will not be tolerated. You must be able to sign the data sheet that explains the challenges. Uh, there are six, respons six responsible ways of doing it. Avoiding their production in the first place is recommended. Then reducing their production by decreasing need to use them. And then recovering and reusing them for some other purposes. Basically recyc recycling these products. Then we also advise to break down some of these products so that they're not toxic. Removing the different components of a product so that when they, because when they mix, they become more dangerous and severely uh, uh, toxic. Then storing them in a lock-proof containers. This is basically the things that we recommend countries to develop. Beyond the Rotterdam Declaration, beyond the Rotterdam Convention, we have two additional conventions. One is called the Basel Convention on Control of Transboundary Movement. From the title, it is the control of transboundary movement of Azadias, waste and disposal products. The other one is the Bamako Convention. Bamako is basically African-based. It's an original treaty that looks at the movement of, trans of hazardous and toxic substances within Africa, and also the movement from developed countries to developing countries, of which most of them are in Africa. So basically, the Basel Convention talks about the need to uh, protect human environment. It talks about reduction of hazardous waste generation of these products. How can we be able to reduce these products? And one of the things that it has copied and uh, uh, replicated in the Rotterdam discussion is Prior informed concept and cooperation is one of the things that is, produ is uh, provided for in the Basel Convention. And the critical instrument, the critical component of this convention is the restriction that it brings aboard. That if the exporting country does not have sufficient disposal capacity, you don't have a ship, you don't have a tank, you don't have a container to dispose of these products, to export of these products, do not engage. If the exporting country does not have disposal sites, that can dispose of waste product that you want to export but you've not identified a country where you're disposing of. If it is Kenya, you've not identified maybe it's Uganda, it's Tanzania, you will be restricted to export your product. The other restriction is if the waste are required as raw materials or recycle recovery industry is the reporting country. That these materials that you're trading in must be something that is useful to the country. So that we don't just trade with materials that you're going to dump and sink them, but you want to see how these materials can be recycled by different countries to be able to be used as a product to produce something useful for the country. The Mabako Convention, the thing and one important aspect of it is that it introduces the limits, the transboundary movement of radioactive materials, which the Basel Convention failed to do. Basel listed a number of chemicals and hazardous toxic substances and excluded radioactive materials, which we know in most developed countries, the radioactive materials are the most byproducts of industrialization. So the Bamako Convention came on board and introduced that aspect and said, as part of the next set of the chemicals we are dealing with, it's important also to look at the radioactive materials and restrict the movement of these radioactive materials in least developed countries. The emphasis is on least developed countries because we know industrialization happened mostly in developed countries. But also we know that there are within Africa we have countries that are developed like South Africa, Nigeria, even Kenya ourselves. So we also want to limit transboundary movement of these hazardous and toxic substances within Africa as a whole. So this is why we needed a convention specifically to speak to our needs in Africa, to need to speak to our challenges in Africa. So uh, that's the most important part of this convention. Of course, it prohibits dumping at sea level, dumping in inland waters. Remember, the B Basel Convention talks about dumping at sea. But we recognize in Africa, we may not have connections, connectivity to many seas, but we have inland waters and lakes, so that we also prohibit uh, dumping at that level. This is just a slideshow on some of the waste products. You have them from clinical waste. In hospital, you find injection being put separately, cotton pads being dumped separately. You have mining waste, industrial waste, agricultural waste. We have, uh, have uh, e-waste ships also dumping at sea level. Those are some of the examples. 
Then in terms of our control, we have conditions which we've also discussed. Uh, what are the conditions that must be met in terms of transparent movement of these products? It's also part of the discussion that we've been talking about. So the next uh, item, I want us to look at the procedures for transboundary movement, which is the, the concluding remarks for our presentation for today. That countries must give notification, proper documented notification signed by the relevant authority. If it is NEMA in our context, if it is the custom duty in our context, KRA must be involved. All the relevant institutions within their country must prove that they got the notification from Rwanda that they intend to dump their waste in Kenya. Then we must have consent, the prior informed consent, also is a documentation. A number of different, different detailed documentations that are needed. You must prove that you also received the consent. Consent must be circulated within the member states that are involved in the transaction. Stage three is the transboundary movement itself, so that the document must list down what countries they are passing through, the details of that chemical that is being transported, all the details must be provided in the transparent movement document. It's also a lot of paperwork. The last one is confirmation of disposal. Kenya must alert the other states that yes, we received the goods on the 20th, these are the goods that we received, this is how we intend to dispose of this product, or this is how we intend to recycle this product within the country. So from today's discussion, emphasis is placed on the procedure for transparent movement of these products. We've agreed at international level that it is important to do trade, it's okay, but there's caution, there's restriction of this trade, but also there are conditions that must be met and the procedure is the four stages that we've discussed. As a takeaway, the four stages are very critical in terms of transboundary movement and the relevant laws that we've discussed. We've discussed. There are a number of case laws I want to attract you into reading so that it's only not one way. So please find time to read the Kofu Channel case. Read the Kian case C disposal that happened in Haiti. The Coco case in Nigeria. Those top three cases will be able to give you a summary of what it means to dump. What is the implication to the health of human beings and the environment in terms of dumping products at uh, illegal dumping of products without prior consent, prior notification and um, approvals. Kenyan context, we have a number of legislation. We have the National Environmental Management Authority. We have the National Solid Waste Management Strategy and Authority within NEMA. A number of legislation that you've come up on board with as an institution, as a country, to be able to manage waste product. The challenge is still there. What do we do with Dandora? Who will manage Dandora? Is one of the products that is exposing the citizens who have and toxic substances. But as a country, what are we doing? about it. It's a challenge for all of us, challenge to the state, challenge at the global level, help us if you can in terms of coming up with a plant to be able to manage the waste product. I've come to the end and uh, thank you so much for listening and I encourage you also to have conversation on legal, the legality on the use and threat to use of nuclear energy. Please refer to the advisory opinion by the ICJ, refer to the advisory opinion by the Security Council of the United Nations. It will give you an outlook on whether it is legal or illegal to use nuclear weapon and nuclear energy. Please let us catch up on the e-platform. For further discussion, let us continue to have our chat. Let us continue to have in our conversation. I will be sending announcements, alerts on any emerging environmental concern that should be uh, taken into account when you're doing your reading. Remember the book, the textbook we referred to, use available online platforms to access materials. And I wish you all the best as we continue to manage ourselves safely at home and avoid um, getting into contact, observe social distance. Thank you. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.